serious, redditors have killed someone in self defense, what happened? Did you get blamed for it? I was working in a prison in the UK, while doing my daily routine of AFCs in a cell. I heard the door shut, I turned around sharply and three inmates were standing there, I knew what was going to happen. Instantly I pushed my personal and they rushed me. I shielded myself as best I could while these three guys wailed punches and kicks on me. I started fighting back and managed to catch one in the throat with a punch that crushed his windpipe. As he dropped gasping for air the other two left. I should have tried to perform first aid, but I just stood there and watched him die. An investigation was launched and I had to appear in court. Nothing came of it, but I still think about it sometimes. I've posted this before in another thread so apologies if it sounds familiar. I'd been kickboxing competitively for 10 years prior to this incident. I had broken my arm and had a newborn child. I had one arm in a sling and my baby in a carrier that was in my other hand. A guy must have thought I looked like an easy target and pulled a knife on me while I was walking through a relatively quiet alley connecting two streets. My only thoughts were of my baby so I kicked the guy in the thigh hard. He fell over and I followed up with a roundhouse to the side of his head. Only issue was that he had fallen next to a bollard and when I kicked him his head smashed off it. I don't think I'll ever forget the noise his head made when it hit off the bollard and I'll never forget it. I was charged with manslaughter but the charges were ultimately dropped due to the fact I had my child. The attacker was armed and I had no prior convictions. I still feel absolutely dreadful about what happened and if I could go back and change it I would. But what's done is done. I'll never forget it. I was woken up by my fiancé telling me that she thinks someone opened the back door which is always locked. It was a loud ass door with an even louder screen door that I've never heard anything else sound like. So I told her to lay on the floor and call 911 as I grabbed my handgun from the nightstand. As she was whispering to the operator I could hear at least one person talking downstairs. It turned out that there were two people. I could hear footsteps slowly coming up the stairs. My fiancé set the phone down and I told her to cover her ears. The bedroom door opened and a man was standing in the doorway with something in his hands. I later found out it was a knife. I fired four shots. Two hit the man in the doorway in the chest. One hit the second person who was standing near the top of the stairs in the shoulder. And the fourth shattered my toilet down the hall. The police showed up soon after that. The rest of the night was mostly a blur. The guy in the doorway died there. The one I shot in the shoulder lived and was charged with his burglar buddy's death and a host of other charges. I also remember slipping on the stairs because of the water. I was never blamed for anything. I was asked to go to the station that night to talk to them for a while but I was able to go with my fiancé and not in the back of a cop car. The 911 recording backed up my whole story. I killed two people. Work the night shift so I normally get home around 1-130 am and most times my mother is asleep this time however I could see the living room lights were on and two big shadows were moving around in my house. This was extremely out of the ordinary so I unclipped my Smith & Wesson SD9 there from my holster and slowly peeked in trough a window. There were two guys in their mid 40s in my living room throwing things around and rummaging trough drawers. One man had a handgun and I figured I could wait and call the police from outside the house and keep an eye on them to make sure they don't head for the bedrooms on the second floor. However when I glanced to the couch I saw my mother huddled with my 12 year old niece who must have been spending the night. I knew if I waited for the cops this could go south before they got there. I was able to signal my mother to cover my niece's eyes and ears. I waited till the two men were on the far side of the room. I turned the doorknob and burst into the house with my weapon pointed at the man with the pistol. I told him in a surprisingly commanding voice to drop his weapon. Then it happened it felt like slow motion I saw his arm start to flick upward and I fired 3 rounds into center mass. The second man reached behind his back and I had no choice but to put 4 rounds into him. What I can tell you is it's not like the movies where a person dies instantly and real life people gurgle cry, asks for family members, ask you why you did it and so on. My mother was with an abusive boyfriend when I was 12 he would beat my mother and me, and threaten to shoot us if we did anything against him. One night things got serious and I was trying to find a way out because I knew he was going to kill us. But it got too far by then and I had no way out. In an attempt to save myself and my mother, I shot him. 
He died soon after. I believed that I had done no wrong and wouldn't face consequences for my actions. After all he was going to kill us if I didn't. This was in the state of Ohio though and I ended up being sentenced to jail for 4 years. I still think it was unjust for that state to steal my childhood simply because I was trying to stay alive. But I have moved on since then and try to do my best to make the best of my adult life. I used to live in a particularly bad neighborhood when I was 13-ish. It was around midnight when I heard our front door open. My mom worked nights. And my dad was overseas. So I assumed either my mom got sent home early. Or we were getting burglarized. We didn't have any guns in the house. Or really anything someone could defend themselves with. So I hid in the closets in my room. After a few minutes I heard someone open the door to my room and start rummaging through drawers and such. I didn't really have anything of value. And there wasn't really anything in the house other than a really old TV that weighed upwards of 150 pounds. After throwing all the contents of my drawers onto the floor, I thought he'd be done and just leave. But I was wrong. Something about the closet called to him I guess and he came over and put a hand on the doorknob. I couldn't really think of anything else to do so I looked around for the most viable self-defense weapon I could find. The best I found was a clay bowl I'd made when in school a few years prior. When the door opened, I swung it as hard as I could. The impact was enough to daze him and shatter my shoddy bowl, but nothing else. I picked up one of the shards of the bowl and tried to use it as a sort of makeshift knife. He started backing away and tripped over something on the floor. I tried to jump on him and hold him down, but I was a scrawny kid so it didn't really do much. He kept punching me, and in a moment of fear and adrenaline fueled anger, I stabbed him with a shard of the bowl. I wasn't trying to kill him, but I punctured a vital artery or something. And he ended up bleeding out while I was on the phone with 911. The police took me to the station and asked a few questions. Then called my mom to let her know what happened. They did want to try me for voluntary manslaughter. But dropped the charges soon after for reasons that were never disclosed to me. It really messed with my mental health. And because it was on the news and published in the local newspaper. And it ruined my social life for the next 5 years. But I've accepted it as part of my life and moved on. TL. Dr. House was getting burglarized. Used a shard of broken pottery to stab the burglar. Hit a vital artery. Almost got tried for voluntary manslaughter. Edit. Someone wanted me to add a TL. DR because I forgot to make the post in paragraphs. Here you go metastatic spot. Fairly new to posting on Reddit. So forgive me for not knowing I need to put a TL. DR. Reading these kind of posts made me think. How come all of the storytellers have an available pistol somewhere? Then I realize that the pistol usually is the only reason they are able to tell the story. I'm retired now but while I was a cop, I won't get into too much detail because I don't want his family to see this or anything like that. We had a call of a guy shot. Deal with that call he was a gang member and he lived. We had a description of suspect vehicle which the shooter was driving. We find the car parked nobody is in it but we find guns and large amount of meth in the car. Find an ID and the guy is wanted for several violent crimes and his record says he is considered armed and dangerous. Use extreme caution. So we are dealing with that when we see a guy walking. It's like 3am. Away from us. I drive over and spotlight him. I didn't know if it was our guy or just some dude out for drinks on his way home. He looks back at me and starts running. So I chase him on foot he stops, turns and starts shooting at me. I remember how I was so shocked at the muzzle flash coming from his gun. So I shoot back as well as another officer who is coming from another angle. He goes down and I get to cover. We call in the cavalry and some other officers approach. I watched as they walked up and grab his arm to put it behind his back and it was lifeless. I remember thinking wow, I just killed a person, he's dead. I wasn't really upset. More shocked I was not hit. For a week after that I was sure I had to have at least a grazing wound I did not feel. We did the whole internal affairs thing. I did my interview. Spoke to our police union attorney. The depth psychologist all that. I was not upset at all oddly. They called my then fiance, now wife, and she was woken up. Told what happened and I was okay. Archie then just went back to sleep after saying, okay, good, lol. 
That night I still had a red ton of reports to do which sucked so I had to sit at the PD and finish them. I went home real early in the morning and couldn't sleep. My adrenaline was pumping still. I wasn't upset. I joked with other guys and we laughed about how I was Neo from Matrix dodging bullets. After something like that you get calls from everyone you know and I couldn't talk about it as it was obviously now an IA investigation. When friends outside law enforcement heard it was me inked paper I got more and more calls. It felt good that people cared. I was not and still am not upset at all. Not one bit. I defended myself and he made that choice. Not me. It could have been just another pose killing a young cop with a family but this one was not and I was glad for that. Few days later I was at Best Buy with my fiance looking at stuff for our house we were buying and a kid accidentally popped a balloon. That sent my heart rate sky high. I shot another guy who pulled a gun about a year later but he lived. He went to prison. Got out and I ran into him all the time as he was a career criminal too. He showed me his bullet scar once. He said he respected me and he deserved it. Weird, the shootings don't bother me at all. The ones that have given me PTSD are the ones where fellow cops have died. I'd seen my first dead cop a few months into my career and it woke my young 21 year old ass up to the realities of the career. But the worst PTSD incidents for me were when kids died. I'd given CPR to a baby that suffocated by his own father who slept in the bed with him and rolled over on him. I'd seen a dead child ran over by a car. Those affected me but they were exacerbated when my child was born. That one still gets me every time I see a pink razor scooter as that's what she was riding. The sight of one makes me sweat and I get angry and extremely aggressive and protective of my daughter. Ugh. Just typing this last part has sent my anxiety up. I was injured at work and had to medically retire later in my career. I've found marijuana. Lol. Helps a ton with my PTSD. I regret anything I ever did in my career that was any type of enforcement against this great plant. Anyways, that's my story. Super late. But oh well. A guy attacked me at 3am. While I was walking to work. Literally barreled out of the woods and tackled me onto concrete with his belt undone. He broke three of my ribs and dislodged a vertebrae. Broke my jaw. I got a surge of adrenaline. And I'm so thankful for that. I tried to choke him long enough to render him unconscious. And I did. He never woke up. It still bothers me sometimes. Nearly 10 years later. I was arrested and questioned in the hospital. And cuffed the following morning after the police obtained security camera footage. I've been asked before how I managed to hold the choke long enough to kill him. I don't know. I may have crushed his windpipe. I have no concept of how long the choke. Or even the whole situation. Lasted. I was traveling down 277 just south of Del Rio. Texas no more than 5 miles from the US-Mexico border. Me and all my infinite wisdom stopped to take a leak on the side of the road. As I was zipping up. I got hit over the back of the head. Apparently it was some sort of initiation deal and it was this 17 or 18 year old kid that hit me. He didn't put enough oats into it and it just dazed me and knocked me to the ground. Two of them started to get into my truck and one started to go through my pockets. I hit him with my elbow and then rolled over on top of him and found a rock about the size of a softball. I hit him in the head with it until he quit struggling. One of the others jumped out of the truck to come help his buddy. I threw my rock at him and rushed my driver door. I got my hand on my revolver, shot at the guy who I threw the rock at, then leveled the pistol at the guy who was sitting in my passenger seat and told him to stay there with his hands on the dash. While I was trying to find my phone a border patrol unit showed up, and then another and another. When it was all said and done I got off with no charge because the border patrol watched it all go down on camera. I had to go back into Del Rio and go to the hospital because I was concussed. The guy I beat with a rock died before the ambulance got there. The guy I shot bled out on the way to the hospital and the third guy was held and then deported. Moral of the story. Don't stop to take a leak in the Bardich 5 miles from the border at 1am. Afghanistan. Midsummer. We were on a patrol through a smaller village that we were supposed to have cleared out of Taliban. Guess our intel was bad because me and a team member both rounded a corner into an alley and in front of us maybe 20 yards away were two guys armed with AKs beating the crap out of some girl. We raised our rifles and started shouting. They turned and raised theirs and I shot. My teammate had froze up and so I'm the only one that shot. 
I killed one of them and injured the other. I didn't get a medal and I didn't get in trouble either. I blamed myself though. Of all the shootings in combat I have seen. That is the one that haunts me. They were just kids. Baby faced kids with a lifetime ahead of them. I do believe that they would have killed me if I hadn't fired. But what makes me sad is that I didn't have the chance to do anything to stop the situation. It went 0-60 and I wasn't the one driving. I just wish that I had the opportunity to yell stop. From cover where they would have had no choice to surrender. They didn't need to die for an ideology that they probably didn't believe in. It was one of the driving forces for me to get some real help when I came home from that deployment. The other ones I medicated with alcohol and being less than kind to my family. That time I came home and got help. Edit. Thanks for the gold. I wanna take this moment to plug. The Soldier Project. A free mental health support system. They are a great org that provides mental health care for soldiers and vets in times of need free of charge. They are a great group of people who saved my life more than likely and have helped countless other soldiers and vets. A lot of these posts seem to be about folks assessing the situation and then using a gun to defend themselves. While practice aiming and handling the gun is easy enough to do. How do you practice managing fear response so you don't either freeze and just have the gun used on you or be erratic and be ineffective or dangerous to yourself and the rescuees? TLDR. How do you practice being calm while in danger so the gun doesn't make things worse? For many years. I was a martial arts self-defense instructor. I felt that part of my responsibility was to provide students an ethical framework about when it was appropriate to use force, as well as prepare them for consequences of doing so. Some of the people who trained with me were lawyers. Some were cops. With their input, I developed a simple formula for what to say after a violent confrontation. Following these steps will save you a fortune of money and years of turmoil and aggravation. He, she they, attacked me. I was afraid for my life. I am injured very shake up right now. And think I need medical attention. Do I need to speak to a lawyer? Say nothing else. Shut your mouth. Do not explain or give details. Every question can be answered with a variation of the above statements. You defended yourself because you were in fear for your life and you can't elaborate further because you are shaken up and need medical attention. If you get pushed for info. You think it might be best to talk to a lawyer. Anything you say, everything you say, will be used to build a case against you. Give them nothing to work with. Cops are not the good guys. Hopefully, you'll never need this advice. If you do, you better have it committed to memory. My squad was working a checkpoint towards the beginning of the Iraq invasion in 2004. As we sat there in the black of night. No sort of street light or anything. I noticed a set of headlights approaching, quickly. The local police were told we would be there. So I stepped out into the road with a giant mag light flashlight and began to flash it at the approaching vehicle. Nothing. I continued to flash my light now while waving my arms. The vehicle seemed to speed up. I added a yelling element to my repeated warnings. The vehicle seemed to speed up. It was time to make a decision. I told my gunner to be ready cause this car wasn't stopping. I raised my M4 and fired into the windshield, rapidly, my .50 gunner followed suit. The car blew past us and quickly veered to the right and into the ditch of the road. Sometimes the driver is on the right of the car sometimes he is on the left in Iraq. I had aimed to the right I killed the passenger, who just so happened to be the local police chief's son. His friend the driver remained alive and uninjured. I was questioned about the incident by everyone from my battery commander to the division commander and CSM. Ultimately it was found that I acted appropriately and was let go. I will never forget the aftermath though. I feel guilty all the time. Throw away for obvious reasons. And also disclaimer. The other stories on here are mostly around self defense. And this isn't. This might receive a lot of hate but I think it's important. My brother killed a guy in a bar fight. It was a stupid argument. He couldn't even remember what it was about afterwards. But he ended up shouting at a guy outside. They got pushy and then he punched him hard in the face. The guy fell back. Smacked him head on the pavement. And was immediately unconscious. Died a few days later in hospital. My brother's life was destroyed. Not just by the it storm that hit him with a police and court case. But also the unrelenting guilt. He tears up talking about it years after it happened. He's so cut up he had trouble sleeping. 
he refused to ever go to a professional but I think he probably has PTSD from the whole experience. Once you decide to use violence in a situation, the consequences of that violence leave your hands. Anything could happen. We looked up cases before and it's more common than you think. I know a lot of stories on here will be from people who killed someone in self-defense. And my brother's story is worse because he was intending to hurt the guy in the first place. He was just never intending to kill him. Please. Please. Consider the implications of introducing violence to a situation. Some of you may disagree but my brother was a good, loving person. He had a girlfriend he adored. He had graduated from a good university. His life was great and he was well loved by all his friends. He wasn't a bad person. He made a stupid drunk mistake that cost two people people their lives. The poor guy he killed. And his own. Nah man. Duck that guy. If you try to rob a visibly injured or disabled person with a baby, you deserve whatever happens to you. Also, I misread the part where you kicked his head thought you said his head smashed off. Seemed like quite an impressive feat to kick someone's head off. Finally, one I can answer. Unfortunately, this is my boyfriend's story. He was stationed in NC and met a girl online. He went to her house to pick her up for a date. She told him she was almost ready and to sit on the couch. Well, out comes her boyfriend with a shotgun pointed right at my boyfriend. Now, my boyfriend is a ducking marine. He's carrying. In a split second, he pulls his Glock and shoots this guy, killing him. He has his gun pointed at the girl now, waiting on police. He didn't have a concealed carry license at the time, but the police looked past that. No charges. I've lived in Detroit for the past 20 years and while the city is going through some awesome changes, there is still plenty of terrible crime happening. About 8 years ago I was finishing up my shift at a local bathhouse when this deranged guy in nothing but a towel came out of a sauna looking for his money. I don't think most redditors are familiar with these types of establishments, but you usually get a small locker when you enter to store your stuff. You have a key on a kind of a scrunchy thing that you keep on your ankle or wrist. Basically what you get at a water park when you go swimming. Anyway, there are signs all over the locker room. Saunas. Private rooms that say to keep your stuff in your locker. It's Detroit after all. I politely told the guy that I don't know where his money is and asked him if he kept it in his locker. I don't know what this guy was on but this was the wrong thing to say to him. He started spouting off that I was the one who took his money and started charging at me. I panicked and sidestepped the guy and he tripped over my foot as I was dodging him and he tried to regain his balance but since this was near the tubs, he slipped on the wet tile and fell headfirst into the squared off base of the Adonis statue. Instantly lights out. A pool of blood formed under him. This made matters worse because the rest of the clients freaked out because they didn't want the cops to come see them at the bathhouse so they all kinda stampeded towards the door. It was total madness. Turns out the guy died on the spot and security cameras showed that he came at me. I guess I may as well tell my story. I went to Vietnam in 1966-70. I was a US Marine Lance Corporal. This means I rank above snail it but below woodchuck vomit. I was a rifleman. MOS 0311. We formed the bones of the fire team. I was placed at a howitzer fire base near the city of Hue along the Perfume River. The river winds through Hue and is featured in full metal jacket. I can vouch for the snipers and authenticity of the scenes. During the siege of Hue I was personally in hand to hand and rifle type combat for 3 days. I'm not proud of this statement but as younger people you need to be told your history. It is important you understand it. Myself and a good friend we called Kuda as he worked on auto assembly lines were separated from our fire team. We had to secure a position of cover to get others to us safely. In going room by room Kuda and I had to protect ourselves. He shot several VC with a 12 gauge shotgun he used on point. He was our radio operator so he did not carry an M1 carbine or a M16. Both were still issued in addition to shotguns as this was early in the war. Kuda had a Smith & Wesson Model 10 or manned revolver. .38 caliber in a cross chest holster similar to tankers and pilots war. I was issued a M14. The M16 was just coming into use. I had also gotten a hold of a TT-33 Russian pistol by killing a VC officer. Our firebase was attacked and he failed to see me laying on the roof of a hooch. I shot him in the head. 
and kept watch on his body overnight. A VC attempted to retake his body so we assumed he had good intel or maps on him. A common VC trick was to booby trap the body. I had about 20-30 feet of rope with a stiff wire hook I would grab a part of the body with. I then played out the rope and gave the body a jerk in case a grenade was set to blow. Nothing happened so I went through his pockets and found a few marked up maps. I took his collar devices and the pistol. I filed war profit paperwork and shipped the gun to my mom some time later. I still own it but rarely if ever fire it. Killing with a rifle is easy. It iced over quickly however. Even headshots with a .308, 7.6251mm, take a bit. The spasm and involuntary jerking motion are one part but nothing prepares you for the noises. The gagging and guttural gasps are very difficult to listen to. Wounds to the center mass have a difficult smell. The gasping becomes even weirder with air exiting if a lung is punctured. Stabbing I guess was next. I have stabbed a man in the throat and jumped to wrap my legs and arm on him holding him to the ground so Kuda could sweep the room. The usual bleeding became pink froth and soaked my blouse through. It was on me a few days and stained my skin a maroon tone. My mother shipped me a Randall number 2 it's basically a thicker tougher K bar in the Brit Sykes pattern. I'm crying as I type this because I cannot imagine how hard it must have been for her. What it must have felt like for a church 3 days a week woman who lived by the commandments to take the train to nick to the gun shop my dad used to get it for me. I didn't trust fully in the K bar, as it was produced by the lowest bidder. I would guess I have stabbed 12-15 men to death. The worst way I ever helped a man meet his end was with my bare hands. A sapper broke our lines and ran for our communication command hooch. For a reason known only to my god I ran at the sapper and snatched him up in my arms. He clicked the detonator several times we both heard the clicks but it didn't go off. I was 6 feet 4 inches and 240 ish pounds he was maybe 5 feet 6 inches 130 pounds. We both flopped into the mud and the battle was on. We beat the it out of each other for what felt like hours. I'm not sure which finished him but I beat his skull in with a log, rock and an ammo can. I was wet in blood all over my face and I had grey matter stuck to me. Brain is like Play-Doh. It clings to you and has a salt water smell. I became an opium addict and a real arsehole due to Vietnam. It took me basically 5-6 weeks of living in my parents hammock in their yard then a year of wandering and working construction or commercial fishing and moving all over the pacific northwest living in a car to come to grips. I pray those of you who have never had to come to the point where the taking of a life is your only option. Please practice de-escalation, evasion and escape. In life since the darkest of my days I have worked diligently to find other ways. One of the proudest moments of my life is when I retired from being a Leo Park Ranger for 35 years without firing a shot in anger. I always found the words or a way around an issue. I learned two important things. The toughest people are the ones who get up and put others first daily. Dad eats bologna so his kid has shoes or mom walks to work so the kid gets the extras and people who tuck their ego and take it on the chin so no one has to get in a situation. Those people are the best and strongest among us. Those are my heroes. Be safe. Good luck. Damn. Scroll too far down. Now it's only politics. Art's question reminded me of a main, spousal premeditated murder story, which resulted in the wife being spared jail time on the premise of self-defense, in spite the fact her husband was asleep when she killed him.